You learn more from failure than from success. Don't let it stop you. Failure builds character. Honorable Chief Guest of the Day, Dr. Ashraf, respected dignitaries, guests, delegates, and all the participants. A very good evening to one and all present here. I, Sumaya K. Ashrafuddin, feel privileged to welcome you all to the 72nd talk of the Inter-Society Weekly Webinar Series, jointly organized by the IEEE Kerala Section, the Institution of Engineers India Kerala State Center, Computer Society of India Trivandrum Chapter, Project Management Institute Kerala Chapter, Internet Society Trivandrum Chapter, Welcome Maulavi Foundation Trust Trivandrum, Life Member FMT Group IEEE Kerala Section, IEEE Engineering in Medicine and Biology Kerala Chapter, the Institute of Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering. I would like to remind everyone to please fill up the feedback form by the end of the webinar, which will be given in the chat. It will only take a minute to complete the same. The link to the recordings will be sent to the email ID entered in the feedback. Those who want certificates of participation may indicate it in their feedback form. We live in an era of machines that claim to be intelligent in their own ways, often utilizing our own data. The informed humans interacting with these machines are often worried about their privacy and security dimensions. The real implications are much more than the individual concerns, but the industry has to survive addressing the genuine issues. In this context, the way forward is the development of technology and policy frameworks addressing the ethical implications of applying artificial intelligence in real world problems. Academia, industry, and the governments across the globe are aware of this impending necessity and are taking proactive steps. This talk will shed some light on some of those directions from an artificial intelligence researcher consultant's perspective. It's time we begin the event. I invite Aishwarya from IEEE for the welcome speech. Thank you, Sumaya. Am I audible? Yes, Aishwarya, you're audible. Okay. The only way to discover the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. With utmost pleasure, I welcome you all to the 72nd talk of the Indo Society Weekly Webinar Series. Today, I'm highly honored to welcome Dr. Ashraf S., Dean of the Digital University Kerala, founder and professor in charge at the Kerala Blockchain Academy, to share his insights on the topic, Ethics in AI, a Practitioner's Perspective. Welcome, sir. Now, I would like to welcome A.G. Harindra Lal, sir, of IEEE for successfully conducting the previous 71 webinar series. Welcome, sir. I would also like to welcome our MC for the day, Ms. Sumaya, our Zoom master, Ms. Afnan Shihab, and Ms. Sandra, introduction to the speaker, and lastly, Ms. Jifti for delivering the vote of thanks. Welcome, team. Lastly, I wholeheartedly welcome all the dignitaries and participants attending this webinar. Once again, I welcome you all, wishing a productive and wonderful evening ahead. Thank you, Aishwarya. Now I invite Sandra Baiju Edge from IEEE to introduce our speaker. One minute, Sumaya. One yes, minute. Sir. I shall interrupt. I shall. Yeah. Good evening to you all. I'm Harinder Lal. Today, we are honored with the presence of a distinguished personality from IEEE, Professor Saifur Rahman, former International Power and Energy Society President during 2018 and 19. He's a life fellow of IEEE. He has made a presentation, a presentation here last year, the 15th talk of the Society Weekly Webinar Series held on 22nd July 2020 on global electric power sector engaging with environmental issues. The new apologies to the non-IEEE members, I take some time from you to honor this August personality. He is a founding director of Advanced Research Institute at Virginia Tech University and Joseph Loring Professor and Director, the Bradley Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering there. He is a founder of BEM Controls, LLC USA, he has strong linkage with India academically, with the public and private sectors, and strong family connections in West Bengal. He has conducted a few India government sponsored GIAN, G I A N programs, Global Initiative of Academic Networks, in higher education aimed at tapping 
the current pool of scientists and entrepreneurs internationally to encourage their engagement with the Institute of Higher Education in India. He has participated in joint research programs in several leading with, the, with the several leading universities in care of India. As the PES president, he state, started IEEE PES corporate engagement program in India in 2018. Bengaluru Electric Service Company, BESCO, and Schneider Electric Company India have joined the program, and several other public and private sector companies are in the pipeline. In this connection, I might add that he is contesting for the IEEE president elect for 2022. I have a fervent appeal to the IEEE members present here to support his candidature and exercise your franchise in his favor and spread the news to your IEEE friends and colleagues. Professor Saifur Rahman, wishing you all the best in the coming election and your professional career. Please take care of your health too. Thank you all. So may I now we start the regular program. Sorry for the interruptions. So yes, yeah. sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction, sir. Now I invite Sandra Baiju Edge from IEEE to introduce our speaker. Sandra, are you there? Sumaya? Yes, sir. Yeah, you, you, can, think... you can just introduce the speaker and go ahead. Okay, Your yes. Sir. Problem, Sandra. Yes, sir. Just a minute, sir. Sorry for the delay. Dr. Ashraf S. is the Dean, Research and Development of the Digital University Kerala and the founder and professor in charge at Kerala Blockchain Academy. He was the founding professor in charge of Maker Village Cochin, India's largest IoT incubator. He received his PhD and Master of Engineering degrees in Computer Science from Indian Institute of Science, IISC Bangalore. After his PhD, he has worked with America Online and IAM Kolkod. He is a recipient of several IBM awards, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Grant, and US State IVLP Fellowship. He has published three books and more than 50 research papers in international journals and conferences. His areas of interest include technologies and business models related to machine learning, data engineering, and blockchain. It's time we welcome our chief guest, Dr. Ashraf, to enlighten us through his knowledgeable words. Sir, please take over. Uh, thank you uh, for the generous introduction. I hope I can share my screen. Hope my screen is visible. And uh, welcome uh, to the session on AI ethics. Uh, I'll be talking from a, a practitioner's perspective uh, because this is a topic uh, which is discussed at length at uh, multiple dimensions. And uh, my perspective would be more from my practitioner's researcher's angle, and uh, I'll make it more of uh, policy driven and uh, opportunity driven rather than uh, making it very technical. Uh, and I plan to speak for another 30, 35 minutes, max 40 minutes, and uh, followed by a QA. That's the uh, way in which this is planned. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, good to uh, interact with. Uh, the distinguished uh, panels and uh, attendees over here. So let's start with a very brief intro to uh, the context of AI today. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, is a term that's coined by uh, Professor McCarthy uh, back in 1956 in uh, Dermot conference. 
And uh, it's a science of making intelligent machines, as we understand, uh, can we mimic uh, the intelligent behavior of living beings is what AI is all about. And we started this journey uh, way back uh, on uh, representing data in a more or less in a rule-based fashion using logic. And we call those uh, systems the expert systems. And now we live uh, in, a, in an era of discovery of automation of discovery, which we call as machine learning. It's nothing but uh, primarily can we figure out, can the machines figure out, or can we build algorithms that can figure out knowledge from available context, which can be historical data, which can be the context in which the model, is, the, the algorithm is sitting, or it can even be uh, experience based. So we have moved from the era of uh, knowledge represented in terms of uh, expressions in a symbolic way to an era where uh, automation of this knowledge discovery is happening. That's called the machine learning uh, based AI. That's where we are in. And there is uh, there are many definitions and research publications around the defin the what what is meant by AI. Let's not dwell into it. Uh, what it says is the bottom line is uh, it's all about uh, building systems which can do smart things, intelligent things, or mimic the behavior of uh, living being. That's where we are. And if you look at uh, or hear from the famous author, Pedro Domingo, uh, it's a 2015 book uh, from him, from University of Washington. His uh, book's name is The Master Algorithm. There are, there are, uh, five mega trends that's happening in the AI context today when it comes to uh, leveraging uh, data and building knowledge. The primary one, we, uh, we are in an era of, of transition from computers that are programmed uh, by us to computers that learn in their own way. So the symbolic uh, data or knowledge driven uh, approach uh, to automation of uh, discovery process of knowledge. That's what the machine learning based context. That's where that's one trend that's being uh, Seen the other trend being uh, automation of scientific discovery, we know that uh, we can we can build algorithms that can find new drugs, new ways of looking at fraud, new ways of scoring people against uh, what do you call people uh, on different dimensions, either the credit worthiness uh, to uh, potential to uh, to a disease. I mean, basically like amenable to a particular context or 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 the extent to which uh, they are susceptible to a disease. So we can do. Uh, automation of scientific discovery. That's another con mega trend it's in the AI world when it comes to data driven AI. And um, the third, uh, probably the most, uh, one of the most important dimensions that everybody's worried about today is uh, uh, we are automating uh, jobs. Uh, and one of my friends was saying a couple of years ago, right, hundreds of computers may replace millions of jobs. So it's not just blue collar jobs, which is more or less automatable by a, uh, robotic process automation, we are living in an era of cognitive robotic process automation. The machine can figure out uh, what you call a, how it programs being structured. And if you can, if you can uh, generalize beyond, you can find out patterns beyond that, you can even automate uh, the art of writing a program. So even a white collar jobs or, or even the, the job of uh, disseminating knowledge at some point in time will become uh, automatable. So anything which to have a repeatable uh, context can be automated. That's where it is. So it's more of cognitive robotic process automation. And the fourth trend being, we are moving from a deterministic world to a probabilistic world. We live in the era of soft computing. We live, uh, we live in an era where uh, deep neural networks or a fuzzy based reasoning systems, uh, which even controls our cars or, or even uh, what you call our washing machines, right? That's, that's happening from a deterministic world to a probabilistic world. And the fifth trend is, is uh, more or less dangerous from a societal perspective. Uh, this is, everybody is moving towards uh, evidence-based decision-making. Uh, so is politics. We live in an era of computational politics and everyone talks about uh, data-driven intelligence and decision-making based on that. And data, it's only like um, data only reveals what you've collected so far. And there is no a lot of unknowns around it. And your models are built around what is known. So that's a dangerous part of it. The rise of evidence-based decision-making. So there are these are five mega trends in which uh, what you call AI being applied, AI being leveraged. And uh, what is it leading to, all right? And how does this uh, learning process, the automation of discovery happening? And again, uh, going by the 
terms that Pedro uh, defines uh, in his book by the Master Algorithm, it, there are primarily five tribes uh, in, the, in the discovery process. That's basically the automated uh, knowledge discovery process which we call as a machine learning. The five tribes or five categories are our symbolist way of doing things, which is all about our logic primarily. Can we, can we symbolize things and can, can infer from that? And then comes the connectionist world, which is more about uh, mimicking a brain, uh, neural networks and things of that kind, connected systems, and then uh, primarily like connected, uh, connected uh, network of nodes and can we learn uh, weights connecting nodes and can we, can we infer things from there. Then comes uh, mimicking the uh, genetic process of evolution, the evolutionist models, and then uh, the fourth one being Bayesian approach, which is more of probabilistic in nature, can, in, can evidence strengthen your belief on something, right? You see more evidences in a context. Can you say that I know more about the context and I do have more what you call believability in the context. That's what the base, you know, the probabilistic inference is all about. And the fifth one, fifth tribe or category of knowledge discovery algorithms is called analogizers, which is the simplest being the nearest neighbor. So can I, I say like, okay, um, since uh, you have bought books of this kind, your friends have bought or your collaborators or those who are similar to you have bought books of this kind, you may be also interested in uh, this book. This is called uh, what Amazon celebrated, which is called the collaborative filtering or the nearest neighbor context or nearest, uh, what you call uh, nearest instance-based approaches. Uh, that's called the analogizers. You are similar to the other one. And so you must be falling in that category. That's the fifth category. And if you look at uh, these algorithms, there are there are master algorithms in the, each of these contexts. Uh, for example, in the symbolist world, the knowledge-driven world, you have inverse detection algorithms and logic primarily around, around logic. Origins are from logic and philosophy. Then comes connectionist. You have models of the kind. The, the celebrated backpropagation algorithm, which uh, functions as the foundation uh, for anything from a simple uh, feed forward neural network to deep learning algorithms. So that's where the connectionist uh, kind of class uh, lies. And then comes the evolution, evolution mm -hmm. model. Evolution models, we have celebrated algorithms of the kind, genetic programming or genetic algorithms and based in, we have probabilistic inference or even a base, uh, what we call way of handling things based in reasoning. Then comes analogizers, uh, algorithms like uh, kernel machines or support machines falls in this category. So all I want to say is uh, the AI has grown from the, the world of uh, symbolist logic, probably uh, the most uh, closer one uh, to the mathematical um, and logic world uh, to a world of deep networks or deep uh, learning algorithms or deep neural networks where we build complicated network structures and learn their ways, right? That's where in, and we can, we can more or less categorize, uh, we, can, we can bucket most of these algorithms into um, probably around five categories. And we, have, we are able to uh, achieve uh, or rather uh, use, leverage these kind of algorithms in, in many a practical context. And we are happy with uh, the performance context, performance uh, being observed out there. That's where we stand today. All right, that's one side of the game. Basically, AI is progressing from what you call the conventional rule-based context uh, to the deep architecture, uh, neural network architecture-based context. And we are all worried about uh, how it performs and things of that kind. The other side of the game is concerns, uh, right? People are like, uh, people of the, of, the, of the kind, Steve uh, or Bill Gates have come out with concerns and say like, hey, AI, this way, uh, may not work, may not be good for humanity in the long run. And you as practitioners or building or, or researchers or academicians or businesses building AI systems, you have to worry because there are concerns that 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 we need to address. Right? I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence, what Elon Musk says. Uh, and uh, people are not different even from uh, the Apple. You can see that eventually they will think faster than us, and I'll get rid of the slow humans. Is what says like. Bosniak things. So that's what there are concerns around that. And do uh, we as practitioners or businesses or even academicians or researchers have to worry about this context is my topic about. All right. Let's look at a few uh, ground realities. Uh, first one being the ethical dimension. All right. We know that a robot on a CRM role uh, treated a human like a gorilla. Right? This is something that has happened in front of us. A pharma company is hiking prices based on granular consumption data, right? This is also happening. 
social platforms using robot generated data for promoting lies and damn lies is happening in front of us when it comes to security and privacy is your mobile device knows more about you than probably what you know about yourself right that's where it is and models which are sitting either at the cloud or at the, at the edge can actually predict what you'll be like kind of doing next and probably like even even predictive actions on your behalf is possible and that's what's happening that's where we are here all digital footprints are machine read or a data layer is created so digital native seemingly free services is a reality all right and that's primarily about the systemic context and coming to the social uh, context we have robotic uh, cognitive process automations and the future of jobs is or skills are changing and how does it affect humanity so these are the concerns some of the concerns of the realities that are staring us and as a as practitioners we have to worry about these dimensions and that's the question that that we need to uh, probably address in this uh, maybe like next 20 minutes or so right now what uh, who could be an actor a bad actor in the ai context it can be anybody it can be any can be military or government or corporates or even psychopaths or, or criminals anybody who builds ai and deploys ai can be a potential bad actor right so how can ai and the current uh, perception of ai is more of a black box uh, and when we build solutions uh, when we build and deploy solutions uh, using ai as one of the components right with uh, that automation of discovery as a as a part of the process we need to worry uh, on the technology front primarily on three dimensions one is the transparency of the model right you build a model all right and when you have built a model you should be able to understand uh, the working of the model you should be able to say like hey this particular this particular uh, what you call a model that i have built is 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 actually ranking or primarily giving a number for me uh, represent the credit worthiness of an of, of a customer based on this dimension this is how it's, the decision is taken so the understanding of the uh, decision making process is one concern the other concern is like given a particular uh, individual and you have taken a decision saying like okay this uh, we cannot give uh, what you call credit card to this customer or this particular person is 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 potentially having this kind of a disease Uh, you should be able to at an instance you should be able to explain the decision understanding the reason behind each decision uh, this is more about uh, the right to explanation and then comes uh, the third dimension uh, can you mathematically prove that right uh, with the same conditions in place it's provable that this is what the decision is right can we attempt those dimensions and whatever be the context when we build and deploy an ai building trust is the key and key for not just adoption key even for the survival that's a that's a statement that i want to hear and how do we and what, what are the ways in which a uh, dangerous thing can get into an ai box there there can be like kind of multiple dimension one can be a deliberate action somebody who who in, with an intent uh, creates an ai and which which uh, with a purpose purposefully uh, what do you call selects data selects algorithms or, or selects a process or deployment models in such a way that you actually like you know, uh, the decision making process is uh, potentially uh, uh, not believable right trustworthy the second is more of side effect some bug may have created and uh, proper testing may not have uh, what it happened it can be a poor design the third being uh, what you call the environment you are actually like design the system in a context of a particular uh, probably a country and you reposition that in a another context where uh, some of your assumptions on the model or even the data may not may not uh, what you call hold good and you are you are you can go wrong and the fourth being uh, more of it's more of uh, what you call i would say a little more dangerous dimension than the the second and the third one uh which is called a runaway or or an emergent phenomena meaning over time a boat uh, becomes a racist is an example for a treacherous storm right this is also possible so this is basically an emergent emergent phenomena out of over time it learns and then it learns the wrong things or or learns to do the wrong things is an emergent phenomena so this can also happen among all these deliberate is the most difficult things to address all right and how do we address this all right one of the primary uh, what we call means to address this is having the right set of regulations and i've done a survey uh, of of all the literature out there and i could make out that there are 
uh, more than 30, I think 30 or 32 countries or more than that, uh, there, there is an AI uh, strategy uh, for that country to exist, uh, right? There are 30 plus countries over which there is an AI strategy exists. Uh, strategy for adopting AI do exist and probably another 20 plus countries or more than close to 25, 30 countries where uh, an AI strategy is being worked out. And all these uh, AI uh, related regulations, one of the primary concern is a responsible AI. At a global picture, I have just listed out a few like European Union has ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. Uh, released by the high level expert group and likewise singapore has model governance framework us usa has and likewise this is not an exhaustive list just a representative list that i've taken right so more than maybe like close to 50 countries are on the verge of of having uh, what you call talking about a responsible ai which means that uh, regulations are coming out uh, mandating that you need to be uh, responsible and being ethical or or a ethics is more about uh, the moral uh, principles or values and responsible meaning uh, you are you should be ready to apply or or respect those values to build a responsible uh, context all right and what is happening in the in the indian uh, context indian context is uh, yeah we had this national strategy for artificial intelligence uh, published by media in june 2018 and very recently i would say february 2021 um, the media again come out with a report, a proposal on, on principles for responsible AI. And it talks about uh, primarily seven dimensions, right? I'll, I'll go to each of these dimensions uh, in detail and uh, let us discuss how this affects the practitioners or business perspective, all right? And, and these are principles uh, talking about uh, what are those guiding uh, moral principles which will, which will potentially uh, take us to an application context of responsible AI and the actual implementation plan uh, or, the, or that suggestion is yet to come from Niti Aayog and Vider. And it was expected in somewhere in August or September, maybe in another month's time, we would have that implementation plan. So let us look at the, the principles behind the, the, the published uh, Niti Aayog report. The first principle, uh, they're talking about uh, the principle of safety and reliability, uh, right? Safety is an interesting concept, uh, say, uh, somebody's data uh, being uh, or a model from a model if you can make out that this particular data of this particular person is being used uh, to train this model on a trained model which is possible as of today uh, which is basically okay somebody's medical data is being uh, what do you call being uh, used and and then you train a model and likewise you have you have aggregated data and you have built a model right safety concern is primarily uh, you have built a model and then uh, whether you are susceptible to disease is actually decided by a model. And then uh, you figure out that uh, the model is actually uh, not using your medical data, rather your financial or, or, or your, your, I mean, it's looking at your wallet and deciding that uh, you, are, you are potentially having this disease uh, to drive you to a hospital or a, or a medical system, right? This is a potential safety concern. Primarily, uh, when you build a model, how do you make sure that uh, it's actually looking at the kind of uh, things it should be looking at to take a decision? That's what primarily the safety dimension is all about. And reliability, as we know, like the classic definition of reliability, you should be you should have it's you should have a reliable system uh, being built using AI. And this, the safety and reliability concerns are more of a systemic consideration. What it says is understanding AI system functioning for safe and reliable deployment. So. A system which is looking at your wallet rather than your medical data to say that you have this disease is a, is 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 not a trustworthy system from at least from a safety perspective, and you can't rely on its prediction because over time you do have an emergent behavior whether there you will identify all all people with probably some uh, what you call contextual data which may not be relevant to the medical context and ultimately it decides that yes such people have to be have to be tagged like this this is this is these things can happen and when you build the model you should be, you should be very careful about it that's what the first principle and the second principle is principle of equality this is connected all systems must, must treat individuals under the same circumstances relevant to the decision equally right you can you can actually bias your data you can say like hey, i have a, i have a data where what do you call 99 percent of the context is talking about what do you call it positive case or negative case or whatever i can i can actually bring in an unbalanced data train my model in such a way that my precision or what do you call my accuracy levels are very high 
but I will always buy my bias my decision in some some dimension, which is possible even at a data level, right? You can actually do uh, algorithmic selections in such a way that your 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 model, the model being trained, can be can be can be uh, can doesn't have to or can violate uh, the principle of equality. You have to worry about the, that dimension also. The third dimension that uh, that you need to worry uh, on the systemic context is uh, principle of inclusivity and non-discrimination. So again, you can actually uh, what do you call? It? You can actually train your model in such a way that you you are actually I mean, if if certain uh, parameters are met, which are beyond the consideration that should be taken for, you can tag them out of the context. And even uh, the media report says that what do you call? It? Some of our what do you call? Healthcare. Uh, related insurance policies are designed in such a way that that non discrimination is is a mandate right so you should you should train your model uh, which means that your algorithm selection your data and your processes should be such a way that the ai system should not take incorrect decisions leading to exclusion from uh, access to services or benefits which is very easy to be built right and that behavior itself can be an emergent behavior you can actually build a system in such a way that over time it will become what of what of what do you call it, it can it can actually uh, violate the principle of non discrimination then comes the principle of privacy and security uh, this is again a systemic concern uh, so uh, with the current uh, neural network or deep neural networks there are there are methods with which you can if you can get access to the uh, gradients through which these uh, models are trained or using appropriate uh, perturbation models you can make out whether a particular person's data is actually used to train a particular uh, of, of a deployed model which is possible you have a black box model and you can figure out whether somebody's data is actually used to 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 train that model so which is possible today basically like i mean such a context such an instance was used can be figured out right that's more of a privacy concern i am worried more on a security concern so for example uh, a system uh, trying to figure out it's more of an emergent behavior over time that hey these kind of people on these geographies with these kind of characteristics are susceptible to these kind of uh, what do you call it, attacks right it can even be so for example our medical data you compute that if 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 uh, what do you call these kind of people uh, leverage or uh, is having this kind of diseases and they use these kind of medicines and they are they have developed these kind of what do you call side effects and probably that can lead to another disease or whatever right you can actually give uh, identify dimensions where uh, what do you call the possibility of adversarial attacks can be can be can be figured out by an algorithm so that's more of a security risk than a privacy risk or an aggregate data even at a personal level uh, you may be able to uh, the system the model may be able to figure out uh, what we call or expose security threats that's the fifth dimension and the the uh, the media report uh, says you should not do that and the principle of transparency is i have already explained this is more of uh, basically explaining the the models and decision making process uh, and uh, they are the the report is actually talking about uh, having audit logs and uh, things of that kind to ensure that you have a fair honest and impartial guarantees uh, for accountability and uh, transparency that's what it is it's more of a systemic concern and the next concern that the report is talking about is accountability what is accountability right the the, the you know that uh, the famous uber uh, what do you call case where uber uh, taxi the auto uh, what do you call uh, uh, the taxi which was driven by ai go hit or the, or the vehicle which was driven by ai go hit someone and then who is responsible for it and even the even the what do you call the the context in which say for example you are building a model and building a model uh, for for consumption by the world and when you build the model there are people who give you the data there are people who clean the data there are people who uh, leverage the data for training there are people who have selected the algorithm there are people who have implemented the algorithm there are people who have deployed or rather train the algorithm and uh, to build a model and then deploy the algorithm and there are a lot of uh, what you call activities out there and the accountability is a genuine concern because uh, the ai deployment process the deployment process is a many hands problem and can be can be actually uh, treat the ai itself as a legal uh, what you call i mean being accountable for someone is a, is a, is a concern that uh, probably some of the uh, what do you call the the legal uh, people over here uh, can potentially look into this dimension because 
who is accountable for the activity uh, or the action that an AI has taken is a question that we need to worry about. And the last concern, the seventh concern they, they're talking about is more of, uh, of a societal consideration, a principle of protection and reinforcement of positive human values. Uh, in this context, they are talking about uh, respecting our constitution than societal morality. Basically, constitutional morality should take priority over, uh, over societal uh, morality, primarily because uh, so societal morality is more of it can even be a majority in decision, but the constitutional morality is a well thought out, uh, what we call document and uh, mechanism, and that needs to be respected, is what uh, the report talks about. So, malicious use uh, of what you call uh, of AI, we have seen uh, in multiple geographies. I don't want to mention, but things of the kind, Cambridge Analytic and all that is in, in, is in, is in, uh, is in, is a reality and uh, the job loss or reskilling up scaling opportunity or can we find new opportunities will ai find new opportunities for repositioning our human resource or the next uh, generation of skills so that we'll be able to create opportunities then then losing opportunities even on a white color context is something that we need to worry about these are the dimensions that the the report talks about and i've already told you uh, they have to come out with the the media come out with this uh, uh, report uh, by uh, after interviewing a lot of people uh, and then considering various international bodies, consulting international bodies and things of that kind. Then they they say like ethics uh, is an emerging field and should be an ongoing research. And they they worry about more of constitutional morality over it, societal morality when they have created this principle. Basically, a uh, case studies in India and the world is considered uh, rights according to the Indian constitution and the principles where they write out. This all fine. That, so India also do worry about responsible AI, and that's all I wanted to say on multiple dimensions, right? And uh, this is a this is a work by uh, our friend uh, Santosh, uh, who was actually uh, an ICE officer. Uh, he was heading the Tamil Nadu e-governance agency. He came out with this scorecard uh, called a DeepMax scorecard uh, to assess the readiness of an AI solution. In a context before deployment, you need to identify the diversity, you need to quantify the diversity, equity, fairness, ethics, privacy, data protection, misuse protection, audit transparency, and cross geography. Interestingly, this was proposed in 2020, and the actual media report came out in 2021. So, and they even have a publication around this. So, Tamil Nadu has some actionable uh, dimensions where uh, they were talking about. Um, we can we can have a scorecard. Tenega is coming out with it, I and mean, he's having a scorecard where any AI application before deployment for for the delivery of a service is actually uh, what do you call it, scored against this dimensions, and then then they then they uh, clear it off, right, for deployment or reject it for reasons thereof. Right, that's 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 what the Indian context is. So there are actionables also in the in the Indian 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 uh, what do you call it. Yeah, yeah, responsibility uh, context, right? And then comes the technology. How do we do all this? Uh, how about what are the technologies for uh, responsible AI, or how do we how do we build this? Uh, there are multiple uh, initiatives across the globe. Uh, one of the primary drivers being DARPA. Uh, they talk about what's called explainable AI, and um, there are other approaches like guaranteeing AI robustness against deception, understanding group, and they are not the only ones. There, there is Google, Microsoft, and IBM have also received toolkits uh, for uh, responsible AI. They have this, uh, what do you call, uh, frameworks out there and things of the kind, Lime, Sharp, and many, many, uh, what do you call, technologies were developed by research institutions and even World Economy Forum has launched a global AI action alliance to accelerate that adoption of trusted AI. So responsible AI and building technologies for responsible AI is also addressed at a global scale. Right. Uh, what is the need for ex uh, explainable AI? Uh, currently, like we build models which can perform, which can actually do our job, right? And it's being deployed in, from transportation to military. And uh, when we, when our models are giving us uh, decisions, uh, we are we are not worry, much much worried about the dimensions such as why did you do that? I and mean, we can ask the model why did you do that and why not something else. Uh, when do you succeed and when do you fail? When can I trust you? And how do I correct an error and things of this kind beyond the performance matrices? But on the performance matrices, which is like a precision recall or whatever but that we that we worry about, all right? And uh, one of the most celebrated the 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 technologies of the current era when it comes to the deployment of uh, machine learning is deep learning neural networks. 
So you have got multi-layered networks trained uh, primarily using backpropagation or variance of algorithms. And then what it does is it can do anywhere from a, a cat to dog uh, classification to uh, complex, uh, what do you call it, adaptive uh, uh, training models, which uh, which uh, things of the kind of deep mind uses or which which has uh, succeeded against uh, the 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 Go, uh, the famous player in uh, Go game, the AlphaGo. So basically, we have we have we, we leverage uh, deep neural networks, uh, which is pri primarily driven as of today by the by the performance parameters. And then, what is explainable AI is primarily around right the conventional AI is you have training data, you have learning process, and you build a model, and the model says it's some sort of. Uh, what do you call uh, it says like I mean with some sort of a measure it says I know that I think that this is a cat uh, with and uh, I measure of my measure of what do you call I mean my confidence on this is more of, uh, of this right and the explainable AI talks about it's not just I need to say that this is cat I'm also saying that this is a cat because it has fur it has whiskers and it has claws and I've also seen these features and that's the reason why I'm saying this is a cat I understand why I've taken this decision. I understand why not, right? I know when you will succeed and things of that kind. I should be able to go beyond giving you a decision. I should be able to explain why I've taken this decision. If you can build models of this kind, this is this is what explainable AI is all about. So XAI, we have a lot of models which are all uh, primarily around uh, performance. Tomorrow we may have to, right? If you if you plot it, uh, we may have to move to a context where we may have to uh, talk about what we call explainability also. The framework uh, would be something like this. You have, you have decisions along with that. You will have an interface, an explanation interface where it will say, yes, I've taken the decision because uh, this is what I see. And from this context, I have concluded that this is a potential a score that this person can get. I'm rejecting this application because he is not having these dimensions. Or I can even say like if his salary was 5,000 rupees extra that than what he gets today, uh, he would have got a credit card. So this is what it is. You can actually give explanations in multiple dimensions, right? So XAI, the, explain, uh, the, uh, the XAI dimension, the explainable AI is primarily talking about performance uh, versus explainability and what we, uh, I've already, as I've already mentioned, we are living in an era of deep explanation where we, are, we have deep learning networks, but deep explanation is still uh, not a reality, meaning deep learning networks, which has explainable capability, explainability capability still in the research uh, context. We don't have a deployable solutions out there. All right. And the other, other, other dimension is like, can you build, say, for example, if you have a small linear model or a logistic model, a logistic model where you define your logistic regression model on a particular, on, on a set of dimensions or a set of features. Now I know like, because of these values are appeared in this feature, I can actually, this decision was taken. So we have inherently this, uh, what you call explainable model, for example, a decision tree. So we have such models, but they may not be performing as good as a deep learning network. Can we build, can we build more, uh, what you call, uh, models which are interpretable and explainable is another, another question that we can ask. And the third is we have already built a lot of models, right? We have got all these black boxes. Can you build mechanisms so that these black boxes can be hit from something else? Can we can we actually give more data to the black box and find out why these models are behaving like this? Basically, can we can we actually build a, what you call explainability on top of available black boxes? That's the third concern uh, that the explainable explainable AI world is uh, is, is exploring. And uh, world over, I, even at uh, some of the institutions uh, in India. Uh, there are research happening on multiple dimensions, right from University of Berkeley to Rutgers. You can see like multiple uh, multiple uh, research explorations are happening to build a what you call explainable AI systems. And even in India, there are a few IITs and even uh, some of our groups that are institution, we are also uh, getting into the context of explainable AI. All right. And when it comes to explanation, how do you give explanations? Uh, explanation can be a natural language uh, statement. Expression can be a visualization. I say like, okay, uh, when you are giving this picture, and since I look at these param these dimensions of this picture, or these pixels, or these features, I'm saying this is a cat. All right, I can give you a visualization. I can even give it context. Hey, this looks like uh, these kind of uh, things that I've already seen. So 
which means that and these things are actually a cat so which means that uh, this is this must be a cat right or it can even be alternate choices i can say like if this person uh, was if 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 the if this particular what do you call the 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 ear was like this this would have been more of a dog rather than a cat or if this person uh, what do you call was having um, this a little more salary maybe a uh, 5000 rupees extra he would have been uh, credit worthy right these are the these are called the alternate choices there are multiple ways in which the explanation more or less can be more so the ways in the explanation can be can be brought in uh, to the to the to the actual decision making context right and how do we do uh, how do we build explainable ai uh, there are you can you can actually do it at at at, at uh, what you called three uh, ways one is before you actually build the model pre building right pre modeling before you actually uh, build the model you can do an exploratory data analysis and say like hey, these features are actually residing these things um, you can even do a visualization you can do a visualization with feature uh, mapping feature reductions feature extractions or whatever and then you build interpretable dimensions of uh, features and then you build models on top of that and you can actually choose uh, careful selection of algorithms say for example if a decision tree does your job go for it because and you can even uh, have good uh, practices for the development processes right when you have uh, say for example you have a you have a imbalanced uh, data context you may have to use something like an active learning where you don't you respect all the classes which are involved which even when that's a minority class you you make sure that everybody is represented in a proper way in your model so that you don't get biased to anybody right any any concept space so that's that's something that you can so you can have pre modeling explainability you can and the second category is explainable models there are like intrinsically explainable models as i said decision tree or logistic regression is an example there are there are models of this kind or else you can actually uh, use uh, some sort of a feature engineering so there are there is research literature talking about uh you can you can build explainable features out of non uh, methods like a what do you call an a feature uh, selection or extraction or even even uh, feature learning uh, techniques such as neural networks and then you build uh, what do you call then you place an intrinsically explainable model on top of it so that you know what the features are and now you know the model also right how the model works so we can explain uh, the entire process that's uh, hybrid models then uh, there is there is uh, there are frameworks that are come out uh, in the primarily in the research literature some uh, like ted teaching explanation for decision which is a ted this is i think it's a framework from uh, ibm which is saying uh, along with your model you can actually uh, along with your decisions you can actually uh, connect your explanations also so from your data you learn uh, you learn a function which gives you uh, the decision and the explanation so you can actually um, uh, connect the two and then uh, you build the model so basically like such frameworks are are also uh, there and the last category is you already have a model you have a black box uh, can we do a post model explainability this this is uh, called the post hoc explainability and most of the explainable ai research is currently uh, available in this and in this context you have methods uh, right from uh, say for example in sense based uh, explanations to perturbation basically like if you if you have data and you perturb the data and see how the perturb data or the model responds to the perturb data and then you basically build explanations on top of it or there are models which you can which can actually uh, there are models which which has uh, what you call looked at uh, backward propagation and then uh, like a i would say an integral gradient which uh, google talks about so google's uh, what do you call the a cloud the google cloud do have uh, explainability on black boxes using what is called the integral gradients basically it's 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 a, it's a, it's a basically a back propagation uh, context so there's enough of literature research rich research literature available out here uh, which is talking about how do we build uh, explainability to the to the black box context if you already have a model all right that that brings me uh, probably to the last slide uh, of my of my talk which is a ethics the practitioners concerns as practitioners either as a business or a consultant or even as an academician we need to worry about the fairness right we should make sure that we should avoid bias meaning bias not just in terms of data or algorithms even on the development process or the deployment processes you should not you should make sure that you build models 
you you select data you build models and you deploy it and uh, train and deploy models in such a way that you avoid bias and the other concern is explainability explainability talks about three dimensions even though the current uh, context even at the indian indian uh, what you call scenario they talk only about interpretability probable transparency and explainability but there is a probability probability dimension also so if we can build provable algorithms which is which which is which is practically possible it, many of the machine learning uh, what you call and developments of the current era can you build provable algorithms that will be the ultimate goal of explainability and privacy and security privacy i've already told you like i mean privacy is more of what you call concerns that your your mobile data being leveraged it knows what you talk in what context you live and how much you work and then using that it's predicting that you are you are probably going to have this kind of a problem all right and a lot of such data is leveraged is utilized from a geography and and, and understanding and, and and predicting a company is trying to make a prediction that all right this is an opportunity or rather there's an opportunity to introduce a drug with this kind of side effect so that i'll get an opportunity to sell another drug in another five years is is definitely a concern right these are these are some of the what you call from a, from a uh, what do you call it, from an ethics angle from the from the from the dimensions of uh, moral uh, value moral values and principles out there uh, these are some of the concerns that a practitioner has to worry about and this is being uh, will be mandated very soon by most of the countries uh, which are which are embracing ai as a technology for solving their problems and we as academicians or business uh, businesses or practitioners or consultants cannot ignore this because it will be mandated by law by the regulators very soon and the survival is is to work on algo or, or work on uh, what you call understanding these this moral principles and values and then respecting them so that we'll be able to build apply them to build a uh, responsible ai and that's pretty much for my side and all i want to say conclude is ai this is a uh, gartner's hype cycle in 2020 we are yet to get the 21 thing responsible ai is still at the peak of inflated expectations but will be will be a reality very soon and two to five years is what the uh, gartner says as per the what do you call the the color from the from the from the curve we can see that two to five years this will become more of what you call l reach um, a plate of productivity and in the current era, we as practitioners, we need to worry about it. And AI ethics, right? Understanding those moral values and principles and applying them for a responsible uh, AI uh, adoption is key to our survival as an industry, as, as a science which will uh, push humanity in the positive dimensions. And with that note, I would uh, like to open up uh, the floor for any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was truly a wonderful session. We go to understand and learn a lot from your presentation. So we do have some questions in the chat section from the participants. Can we move on to the question and answering session? Sure. sure. Yes, sir. So the first question is, why these are Indian? Why are these in Indian context only, or is there anything specific to AI? Any AI ethics specific to India? No, nothing of that kind. See, that's where I started. I said like uh, there are. Uh, I mean, at, at least I've seen uh, thirty-two countries where there is uh, AI. Uh, there is a strategy for AI, and. Uh, responsible AI becomes a component of that strategy. So it's not specific to India. I just wanted to, I was, my stock was primarily uh, on the dimensions that the media report uh, uh, mentioned, but the concerns are more or less same across the globe. So, and another 20 plus countries where this is being drafted and then draft form is available. So at least 50 countries do have very similar concerns. So nothing to do with India and the concerns are more or less uh, global in nature. Yeah, that's Thank that's you, my comment. Thank you, sir. The next question is: Use and misuse of the artificial intelligence is possible with time. 
how the how the developed AI modules can be tested in the lab, loopholes found out, and corrections implemented. A continual improvement concept is a continual improvement concept re realizable. This question was asked by Ravindranath M. Sir. Good, uh, very interesting question. Uh, uh, basically, uh, when Steve passed away, I I, I just wrote uh, probably a comment in in the in, a, in one of the Malayalam the, the famous Malayalam uh, newspaper. I mean, my comment was also there in the among the set of comments they published in the, in the middle of the paper. This was essentially on these lines. Uh, what I want to say is like we live in an era of of, of AI which learns beyond what what we give. Basically, we live in an era of uh, reinforced uh, learning uh, systems where people are even talking about artificial general intelligence can you build systems which are which are which are doing broader set of jobs than uh, narrow ai and uh, yes testing building an ai and testing that in the lab for compliance on these dimensions and deploying it may not be a wise decision and that's where the the primary say for example uh, we can build systems which which goes which goes far beyond the conventional uh, what do you call knowledge driven uh, trained models say for example rl is all about that we live say for example uh, our our deep uh, deep mind right uh, deep mind is talking about uh, deep q uh, learning algorithm which is primarily like i mean you build on your expertise and as you go along you find new strategies of getting better and better and think of a context where this is being applied in military. That's what uh, Steve uh, Steve's statement was all about. Uh, Stephen Spielberg, uh, no, the the what do you call it? The, the 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 basically what I want to say is uh, the 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 films have uh, what do you call it? pictured it and uh, the what do you call it? the 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 scientific world is talking about it and uh, uh, it's basically the moment you bring in a reinforcement context to a military a re reinforcement technologies to a military context, you are basically like I mean, you are going to a context where a continued uh, monitoring uh, framework is the only way to go. So a lab test followed by uh, what do you call I mean deployment doesn't seem like a good uh, good solution uh, to address this issue. If that's what uh, uh, the question is. All right, because we have gone much beyond uh, what you call mimicking a living being. Uh, you can actually go far beyond a, beyond a uh, uh, given context in the reinforced way. Does that answer my question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. There's another question. There are other questions. The next question is: Can you throw some light into the latest research or studies on explainability of AI algorithms? That's what I'm yes. assuming. Yes, yes, continue, please. Please give some hints or leads on this topic. Yeah, there are there are many. That's where I said I have not covered any technology over here. Uh, just look for post hoc explainable AI or post modeling explainable AI. You get at least 50 plus research publications in the very uh, recent past, which is talking about anywhere from an instance based explainability, explaining, explaining a particular why a particular decision was taken. Um, to uh, perturbation-based uh, explainability for black boxes, uh, to, to frameworks-driven explainability and, and, and uh, back propagation-based explainability, uh, decision uh, rule, uh, decision key-based explainability. There is, so look for, just do a Google search around post hoc, P-O-S-T-H-O-C, explainability, you get ample literature. And the other side, uh, basically, Building uh, deep explainable models with deep uh, neural explainability is still in the in the early stage of development. So, Maya, one minute. So, Maya, one minute. Yes, sir. Uh, for uh, our honorable guest from IEEE, IEEE fellow, I, I introduced him earlier. Would like to ask a question to uh, the speaker in person, Professor Saifur Rahman. Please go ahead. You can un unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. Jacob, Jacob, please unmute his phone. Jacob. Jacob. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ashraf. Interesting talk. When I saw the title yesterday, the day before, 
AI and ethics. And IEEE senior person, we focus very heavily on ethics of IEEE members, very serious, we take very seriously. I give a lecture at Bangalore, Delhi and Kolkata, ethics in publishing some years back. So listen very carefully what you said. And I would like to add to your comment and have a question following that is the young generation work in IT sometimes are, are lured into doing something that they don't believe in, but they are, they are hesitant to refuse. This is very important. I should remember, you can say no to your boss. If you think what you're being asked is unethical. I don't have this message widely understood among young generation that you have a higher standard. Ethics is big, more than legal obligations. Sure. So I, I hope people in the audience are listening and understanding this. And I appreciate you raising the issue very clearly among the audience today. My question is, toward the end you mentioned reskilling and upskilling in AI. That's my pledge for IEEE election, in fact, up reskilling. My question to you is, how do you hope to use AI to help engineers changing jobs, to reskill themselves, they can be more marketable? Okay, interesting. Okay, that's one of the areas where, I mean, I have not attempted that in the AI context. Uh, reskilling was one of my agenda when I, when I was setting up the Kerala Blockchain Academy. Uh, it's, it's essentially a reskilling opportunity and we have trained more than uh, 6,000 plus people across the globe today. And that's what it is, it's a two-year-old uh, avenue. And when it comes to AI, uh, AI is actually opening up a new uh, age opportunity in the, in the data space. And uh, most of this AI, the black box AI at least today is, is available in a uh, accessible fashion. Either as a library, meaning, so if you are a practitioner or somebody who is literate in the programming context, you applying or, or learning and applying a already available framework to find new ways of doing uh, your job right this is this opportunity because it's more of a skilling than a uh, than a what do you call than a fundamental uh, dissemination of knowledge because the ai is more of consumable uh, is available in a consumable fashion than you don't have to know about the principle of uh, probably uh, gradient descent or uh, deep kernel machines or functional uh, what do you call uh, functional analysis before you before you leverage a kernel machine because kernel machines if you know like i mean these kind of libraries do exist and if you have programming skills uh, you can you can learn uh, the right set of tool sets which is available accessible to you in the open source world and if you can skill people in those dimensions, what happens is you have productive human resource to do things and they don't have to say for example when it comes to any technology in the conventional engineering uh, domains, we have people at all levels of uh, what you call uh, detailing, meaning expertise. We have people who actually uh, probably uh, good at designing uh, things, uh, building things, uh, maintaining things, and even at uh, what you call uh, doing uh, jobs of installing things at somebody's home, right? So, but with computer science, uh, it is more of programming was a mandatory requirement uh, with detailed expertise. With, which is more of knowledge driven, but AI or the, the new automation of knowledge, that's what I said, with an automation of knowledge, which is called a machine learning. So you have correct data, you place that automation engine into the context, the data getting converted into knowledge and that knowledge, you may be able to say like, okay, you had, say for example, you have now new opportunities to look at massive data, massive genetic data of the country, and say like these kind of what do you call uh, chemicals would be more more good for these kind of people, which wouldn't have been happened because the I mean our memory is more of I mean the kind of data that our memory can process versus a computer's way of uh, generating knowledge, right? And we have the right set of tools. The automation of knowledge discovery is in place, which means that from huge collections of data with the consumable, uh, what do you call, uh, libraries and uh, capabilities in place, we can create a new age of uh, workers, knowledge workers, which goes beyond the conventional, uh, what do you call, click and do jobs. 
they can actually they can give data proper clean data to the context and the knowledge worker and the, the algorithms will find out they should only be able to interpret and go beyond whatever it can even be a doctor trying to uh, doctor working with a uh, with a what you call pharma person trying to find out a new way of uh, what you call a drug discovery process right which the doctor has I mean, may not have that opportunity in the past because he was more of a what you call a clinical person than the the, the other person was more of a chemical person but these two people connected over an ai framework or data discovery leveraged by an AI, i mean by enabled by an AI, ai framework would be able to reposition their skill to altogether a different level so skilling on the automated discovery engines which are open source world and we will find new ways of uh, what do you call new functional areas and domains where you will you will have employment that's that's what i want to say thank you very much i appreciate it okay sumeya you can take over sumeya yes sir yes sir thank you sir thank you very much for those words of wisdom now the next question is consider ai machines developed in different countries with different cultures will they all give the same ethical decision for a given situation how can they handle misinformation and wrong data yeah very interesting question uh, my answer is no they'll behave like enough and that's why i said contextualization and uh, is very very uh, what you call relevant in the case of uh, deployment and we need to uh, contextualize any model say for example i mean we are talk we are believe in an era of transferable knowledge meaning things of the kind transfer learning but transfer learning again uh, needs uh, what do you call uh, fine tuning to the context um, ethically uh, what works uh, probably in a, in an indian context may not be uh, what do you call may not be even even the kind of say for example you are building a boat uh, uh, what do you call it a chat boat uh, which interacts with the customers in a banking context and the same uh, type of language if used uh, what do you call in a different culture uh, you will end up in trouble so it's it is as simple as that basically uh, no you have to have fine tuning and the ethical dimensions and the and the societal uh, acceptance uh, and the, and the parameters of those uh, what do you call of those dimensions will be different in different uh, cultural contexts that's my answer thank you sir the next question is how can we prevent the misuse of ai by some rogue nations for terrorism and uh, and them attacking other nations yeah that's more of a policy uh, framework and uh, what do you call deployment framework it's basically like and the regulators have to come out with the right policy so that uh, see currently uh, i mean ai is more of uh, what do you call performance driven and uh, the moment uh, we build the ai which is more of uh, explanation driven and this explanation becomes transparent for consumption Uh, which means that uh, when an ai takes a decision or or that decision being uh, tweeted out to uh, millions of people out there right and the explanation is also oh, i mean already there you can actually build context socio uh, what you call political context where uh, this is preventable provided uh, the systems are transparent and the regulations are in place thank you sir the next question would be are engineering standards institutions addressing development of some standards for practicing responsible ai can this eventually help countries to bring in statutory framework for development of ai will the data security act proposed in india impact ai development or incorporate guidelines for ai uh, the answer is yes uh, so i i mean i've gone through the what you call the 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 pdb the personal data protection bill and for that matter gdpr uh, primarily in practical context uh, when it comes to the indian uh, data uh, what about related issues and uh, yeah so uh, my experience is uh, i think article 22 of the gdpr uh, i may not be correct uh, i think article 22 of the gdpr is talking about uh, uh, right for explanation that's what it is 22 of the gdpr uh, gdpr is considered to be the the the, the primary document over which even our pdb has adopted uh, principles from Uh, right to explanation becomes a mandated condition uh, 
so data and the way in which data being used the way in which uh, what you call data driven decisions are or model or or the, the algorithms which build data driven decisions uh, are built uh, the the gdpr or the pdb uh, talks about those dimensions yes when it comes to data and data intelligence uh, these regulations are definitely valid and are are are, are imposing on those uh, explainable data dimensions Yes, sir. Sir, I think you're muted, sir. Sir, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the remaining questions will be answered because we are running too late. Uh, the, the, we have to leave the platform soon. Some other program is on the anvil, so we have to wind it up soon. So the questions will be collected and sent to the uh, speaker, and the answer uh, collected and sent to you. Please uh, send your email ID to me so that I can post the uh, question uh, answer to you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Gifty, Gifty, you can take over the. Uh, other program in order uh, the port of thanks please do it gifty yeah jacob please unmute her jacob please unmute her jacob Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Please go. Okay. Okay. A very warm good evening to one and all present here. Today, we had a very wonderful and informative talk session on the ethics in artificial intelligence, a practitioner's perspective by very renowned and experienced speaker, Dr. Ashraf, Dean of Digital University Kerala, as well as the co-founder and professor in charge at Kerala Blockchain Academy. It was really an informative session on AI and everyone could clarify all their doubts regarding AI. Also, many have posted their gratitude in the chat box too. So thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us and sharing your valuable time with us. I would also like to extend my sincere gratitude to Saifur Rahman, sir, for joining us. I'd also like to thank all the participants present here as they are the one who made this event so special. I'd like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Harindralal, sir, and all the other organizers behind the InterSociety weekly webinar series for arranging such an informative session. Thank you all. Also, we'd like to present a momentum as a token of love from our part. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf, sir. So once again, thank you all for joining the 72nd talk session of InterSociety weekly webinar series. Thank you. Thank you, Gifty. Once again, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our honorable chief guest for taking his precious time out of his busy schedule to be here and for sharing with us your valuable ideas and thoughts on this important topic. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I would like to inform you all about our 73rd talk, LT Line Snapping Issues and Solutions by Dr. Krishna Kumar M. from Kerala State Electricity Board Limited, Trivandrum, which is to be conducted on next Wednesday, September 1, from 6 to 7 p.m. Hope to see you all next Wednesday. Thus, we have come to the end of today's session. Thank you all. Meeting is now officially dispersed. Thank you all the participants, especially the speaker. And also, Safer Rayman and other uh, eminent, eminent participants participant for, for, for today. And thanks all the role players. Please attend the next program. Thank you very much. Thank you for the support. And uh, we expect the continued support from all of you for the successful conduct of this program. Thank you very much. Afternoon. 
Afnan, you can close the program. Yes, sir.